this week's edition of In Focus. We are your local election headquarters, and as of this week, early voting is now officially underway for the primary next month. We'll look at the latest polling numbers a little later on with our panel, but we start with our Claire Curry, who spoke with election officials in Marion County about the early voting process and the efforts to increase voter turnout. Ahead of the May primaries, people can stop by the county clerk's office to cast their vote on who they want to see in the general election. We are open here at the city county building from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. weekdays uh, through the 26th of April. And starting the Saturday the 27th, we will have nine sites, including the city county building, around the county. When it comes to voting, it matters. We had a race, uh, a smaller race last year that was decided here in this county by one vote. I would imagine the person who didn't come in first would have appreciated voters taking the time to come in and cast their ballot. It is very disheartening to know that Indiana came dead last in the Civics Health Index. So we're trying to counter that by going and talking to students and making sure that people know, yes, it does matter. Your vote matters. While early voting is an option, people who want to cast their ballot can also do so on Election Day on May 7th. Claire Curry reporting. Claire, thanks. Of course, the big race we're watching in May is the Republican primary for governor. Six candidates in that race, and we're talking with two of them here today, including former Commerce Secretary Brad Chambers, who, by the way, picked up an endorsement this past week from former Congresswoman Susan Brooks. Chambers spoke with our State House reporter Hannah Adamson about this week's news that a planned semiconductor plant may not be coming to Indiana after all. Almost two years ago, Skywater Technology announced it would invest $1.8 billion in a semiconductor fabrication plant right here at Purdue's Discovery Park District. Instead, concerns over Chips and Science Act funding nipped that plan in the bud. After the federal CHIPS program pulled the plug last month on more funds for research and development facilities, Skywater Technology announced it no longer had a definitive plan to build an Indiana facility. A statement reading in part, quote, The March 2024 decision left us with an uncertain path forward given our business objectives. So this is a Skywater issue, not an Indiana issue? Brad Chambers was Indiana's Secretary of Commerce when the Skywater deal was announced. The agency he used to run, the IEDC says Skywater received none of the $70 million the state committed in incentives for the project. The good news is that it was a performance-based investment we offered. If you don't hire or you don't invest, you don't receive from in Indiana. We had known up front that they were that they had not secured financing. Although Tippecanoe County Commissioner Tom Murtaugh says he's not entirely surprised the Skywater deal fell through. He says the historic decision by SK Hynix to build a nearly $4 billion semiconductor plant nearby will offset the Skywater loss. Skywater being a relatively new startup, you know, um, is kind of a different realm than SK Hynix. Indiana Senator Todd Young, who co-authored the Chips and Science Act, says the SK Hynix deal is much more set in stone. They've indicated that this announcement wasn't dependent on receipt of future uh, CHIPS funding. In a statement, Purdue University says in part that Skywater Technology remains, quote, a valued partner with research opportunities in the works. Reporting in West Lafayette, I'm Hannah Adamson. All right, Hannah, thanks. Now to more of that interview with former Commerce Secretary Brad Chambers, who was quick to call out one of his opponents, the heavy frontrunner in this race for governor, Senator Mike Braun. Braun was at that recent economic development announcement for SK Hynix in West Lafayette, along with Senator Todd Young. And here's what Chambers had to say about that, given how both senators voted on the Chips and Science Act in Congress. I was super impressed that Todd Young uh, sponsored this bill, this bipartisan bill, and I was, I was, I was shocked that, you know, Senator Braun uh, voted against it, because it's a national security, economic security imperative for the country to get semiconductors back into the United States. 85% of them are in Asia. And to do that, the, the, the Biden administration and, and Todd Young specifically, um, you know, created this, this, this program to incent manufacturing to come back to the United States to create Indiana jobs, American jobs. Again, Senator Braun vetoed that uh, and voted against it. Uh, and I, as Secretary of Commerce, you know, for I, I did that job as a volunteer for a dollar a year. 
and as Secretary of Commerce, we landed uh, eight semiconductor companies in this, in this state. High wage careers that keep our kids and our grandkids here. It's good for Indiana because these are above U.S. average wages. These are technology jobs to keep our Purdue grads here and our Rose Holman grads here. So, so it takes time, but the good news is there's momentum around these future focused, uh, and I'm proud of that as Commerce Secretary. You, you know, and I thought it was a bit disingenuous that you know, Senator Braun shows up at the Hynix, uh, you know, announcement when he vetoed or, or voted against that bill. I worked very hard with our team to build this ecosystem, and I'm very proud of the results. Would you support an independent audit of the IEDC or really any state agency on the table? Of course. So first of all, there's lots of transparency with the IDC. All of the transactions that happen get posted on a on a public portal. There's there's a there's a ton of uh, transparency all, transparency all, all the way already there. All right, Brad Chambers there with our Hannah Adamson. Let's get some reaction now from Senator Mike Braun, who I spoke with this week from Washington about the criticism he's faced for appearing at that announcement last week. Senator Young was there. He supported the CHIPS Act in Congress. You voted against it, and some of your competitors in the race for governor said it was hypocritical for you to be there. What, what's your response to that? Well, number one, my competitors in the governor's race obviously are coming up with that and a lot of other stuff because they've been structurally behind for a long time, and we're less than 30 days away there. But that was part of my official job, and I did vote against it because it was mostly like everything else we do. We borrowed the money from our kids and grandkids to do it. There was policy in there that I liked. Uh, I think getting a chips plant landed into any state is a blessing for it. That was on the official side as one of the two U.S. senators, and we are lucky as a state to have gotten it. Uh, how that bill came across, it's like most other bills here. There's good stuff maybe in it, but one of my guiding principles has been, if we're borrowing it to do it, where do you start and stop there? I've tried to be true blue that if it's on borrowed money, I'm going to vote against it, even if I might like the policy. All right. Meantime, this week, Governor Holcomb also weighed in on the topic of economic development as it relates to this race for governor. This is a number of projects across the state just got a major boost with the Ready 2.0 program that will boost local economies across the state. At this event this week, the governor was asked to share his thoughts on his potential successor's approach to economic development. A lot of your would-be successors have criticized the state's economic development strategy, saying it's a top-down approach that they don't think serves local communities. On a day like today, how do you respond to that criticism? I'd say that comment is made out of ignorance. I'd say they should attend a meeting regionally. They should um, get busy doing the work, and they would see just how much local input drives the day. This is uh, a true partnership. And I always, when I see those comments, I laugh because the number of uh, phone calls and texts and feedback that I get from local county commissioners or councilmen who are doing the work, not some critic, uh, but are actually doing things that are making a positive difference in people's lives. And uh, ultimately, my successor, will have that responsibility to actually um, walk, not just talk. Mm. By the way, Governor Holcomb in South America this weekend on an economic development trip. Also this week, we learned about an effort to potentially get Democrats to vote in Indiana's Republican primary for governor. These billboards from a group called Recenter Indiana reminding voters that our state does indeed have an open primary. We spoke with that group's president. We think this is an opportunity for everybody to participate in the determination of who the next governor is going to be, Republican, Independent, Democrat, and this is the mechanism we think makes that work. How do you respond to those who might be critical of the approach or, or feel that it's trying to get around the system somehow? Well, it, it's been done a lot of times. It's not a trick. It's an opportunity for citizens to really make a difference when they can't otherwise the way the Indiana political situation exists right now. Do you feel this kind of approach might get us to move away from this dynamic we're in where these primaries tend to lead both parties uh, toward candidates that, that might be viewed as more extreme on either end? 
Well, Dan, that's, of course, the hope we have. We're an organization seeking to recenter Indiana politics. And one of the things we've noticed is a very small number of people turn out in Indiana primaries. Uh, about 15% of all the Hoosiers show up in these primaries. And they're the most committed, the most extreme, the most partisan. And because of that, our candidates tend in the primary season to move toward those extreme positions because they know that's where their voters are going to come from. So if we can have more voters come from the center, uh, we think that the candidates will have to move themselves closer to the center during the primaries, which is important to us. All right, we'll talk more about that coming up. Also ahead, we'll look at the latest polling numbers and talk with our panel about the former president's comments this week on abortion. And we'll hear from the governor about the economic impact of this past week's total solar eclipse. Straight ahead, stick around.